Tonight, New York State lifting quarantine requirements for domestic travelers. Recommendations on travel in the U.S. from the CDC and the Ithaca Tompkins International Airport. And updates on COVID-19 vaccinations in the county. Roughly 300 seniors have received their doses so far. And Cornell University now requiring proof of vaccinations for students this fall. Plus, in Florida, communities are being evacuated as a toxic water waste reservoir in Manatee County is on the verge of collapse. All that and more coming up tonight on Newswatch. Covering Ithaca and all of Tompkins County. From ICTV News, this is Newswatch. Good evening and thank you for tuning in to Newswatch. I'm Laura Cook. And I'm Tyler Cunnington. We begin tonight with an update on New York State's quarantine requirements. Domestic travelers are no longer required to quarantine upon arrival. This now applies to those traveling by plane as well. This comes as the state's vaccine eligibility expands and the vaccination rate begins to climb. The Ithaca Tompkins International Airport is still advising travelers to quarantine, but the only requirement upon arrival is completion of the state traveler health form. For almost a year now, quarantine upon arrival has been an executive order as New York works to decrease the COVID-19 infection rate. And despite relaxation on COVID-19 guidelines, travelers should closely monitor symptoms and self-isolate if any do arise. The CDC has also relaxed requirements for air travel in the United States. It's now safe for fully vaccinated individuals to travel, but non-essential trips are still discouraged. Fully vaccinated individuals are not required to get tested or quarantine as long as other recommended measures are followed while traveling. Those measures include wearing masks, social distancing, and avoiding large crowds. International travel restrictions remain in place despite travel agency organizations pushing for an end to those limitations. Leisure travel within the country has the possibility of returning this year, but the status of a full recovery for travel is currently unknown. Almost 300 seniors in Ithaca are fully vaccinated after county officials organized a vaccination campaign. The majority of seniors living at Titus Towers and McGraw House, two of the county's largest senior housing facilities, received free rides from TCAT to vaccination sites. Beyond those two facilities, the effort to get people age 60 plus vaccinated has extended to all senior facilities with slight modifications to the campaign. The county has launched this campaign for several months now. Those eligible for vaccinations can sign up via the Tompkins County Registry. The Cayuga Medical Center administered its one millionth COVID-19 test in Tompkins County on Friday. It's been nearly one year since testing first began. Cayuga Medical provides free COVID-19 testing for anyone displaying COVID-19 symptoms or has been exposed to an individual who tested positive. Currently, there are about 200 active cases of the virus in the area, the highest since February. However, nearly 13,000 people in Tompkins County are now fully vaccinated. On Thursday, Newswatch brought you a story on the streetery ahead of its opening on April 1st. Today, our reporter Jordan Broking headed down to North Aurora Street and spoke with visitors enjoying their food outside. Jordan. That's right, Laura. Local diners are more than happy to see a street back open again, just in time for the holiday weekend. In downtown Ithaca this weekend, locals are enjoying the return of a favorite dining experience. The Aurora Streetery reopened this past week after closing last summer. The closed 100 block of North Aurora Street features various dining options for restaurant goers near and far. For my birthday weekend, we came down to hike. And today, since it was nicer weather, we decided to just come explore downtown. Catherine Sherwood is from Syracuse and says she has visited the area often since she was in high school. Having the streetery open once again feels nice to Sherwood, especially as her most recent trips were not as favorable. It was closed off the last time we came and it was kind of disappointing to come down and like, it was hard to come down and like see everything. It being back opened up has been nicer. Last year, the Ithaca Downtown Alliance formed a streetery in order to help restaurants sustain business during the pandemic. Currently throughout New York, except for New York City, Governor Cuomo recently raised restaurant capacity to 75%. For some people like Melissa Potter, this is their first time going out to eat since March of 2020. 
I've been vaccinated since January, but I haven't really felt a strong need to come out, but I'm excited to be back out in Ithaca. COVID-19 vaccinations have also provided a boost in in-person dining, but some still prefer having the outdoor space to enjoy their meals. After my first dose, I have some amount of immunity, uh, but certainly not enough to go eat indoors. So like when I have in full immunity, I would I feel like I'd be much more comfortable eating indoors. John Davenport expressed similar concerns when discussing indoor dining. I don't know enough of the science to say that like I am fully vaccinated now. I only got one shot, so figure I might as well, you know, stick to eating outside and I guess I feel comfortable enough. It seems socially distanced. Now, unlike last time where it was open only for a few months, the street is expected to remain here throughout the summer season, giving you plenty of time to enjoy what the street has to offer. Reporting for Newswatch in Ithaca, I'm Jordan Broking. Thank you, Jordan. Moving on now, Cornell University is requiring all students to receive a COVID-19 vaccination before returning to campus for the fall semester. This announcement comes after the expansion of vaccine eligibility in New York, allowing all individuals above the age of 16 to schedule an appointment on Tuesday. The university plans to hold classes fully in person this fall and has created a COVID-19 proof of vaccination tool for students, faculty and staff. Those who aren't able to receive their vaccination before returning to campus will be expected to get one as soon as possible after their arrival. Ithaca Halal Meat and Grocery on West Green Street is under investigation by the United States Department of Agricultural Office of Inspector General. The investigation was brought on by recurring irregularities into the disbursement of federally funded benefits. Now further information has been released at this time. Ithaca police are collaborating with USDA on the ongoing investigation. Any individuals with information on this are asked to contact the Ithaca Police Department. Now with the section of Aurora Street blocked for the streetery and the closing of the Green Street Garage, there's been an increase in traffic in the Ithaca area. Reporter Daniel Capitolupo spoke with residents on how it's been affecting them. With the closing of Green Street Garage and opening of the streetery, there has been increased traffic all over Ithaca area that stretches around multiple parts of town. A lot of this is attributed to the increased demand for valet at the Marriott since Green Street Garage is connected to their hotel. With the opening of the streetery and the closing of the Green Street Garage, traffic around the Ithaca Commons is much worse than usual and it's very slowed down. Today we'll talk to some people around here to see exactly what they think about the situation. I'm visiting this weekend uh, my kids here at school and the traffic situation is much worse than I've ever seen it. I've been here a lot of times and um, the, the Green Garage is closed and it's causing a lot of bottleneck at the Marriott Hotel, coupled with the fact that there's, the road is closed over here for outdoor dining, and so there's tons of traffic, and it takes forever to get through the downtown. I've never seen it this bad before. With a packed scene at the Ithaca Commons this weekend, this traffic shows no sign of improvement. Cars continue to appear bumper to bumper all around town, and the general flow of things is very slow. Hopefully we'll see improvements in this in the future as they make adjustments to the traffic around Ithaca. Thank you, Daniel, for that story. We move now to updates on when it's likely you'll see marijuana dispensaries in Ithaca. It will be likely before 2022 before a marijuana dispensary opens in Ithaca and Tompkins County. During that time, individuals must go through a licensing process. The state will also be determining regulatory structure. Governor Cuomo's office estimates up to $350 million to be raised in marijuana taxes. The money will go toward education, drug treatment, and black and brown communities harmed by the war on drugs. The governor signed the bill Friday, legalizing recreational marijuana for adults over the age of 21, making New York State the 16th state to do so. The bill relaxes laws around the possession of marijuana and will expunge the records of anyone who committed a crime concerning marijuana. A 26-year-old woman was arrested by state police in relation to an ongoing investigation into a fatal car crash that killed a pedestrian. Natalie Robertson was charged with driving while impaired and criminal possession of a controlled substance. The car she was driving crashed into 75-year-old Charles Moeller on Thursday afternoon in the town of Caroline. Moeller was transported to Cayuga Medical Center, where he later died from his injuries. 
Now our weather person, Simon Neeland, is here with a brief look at what's to come in the week's forecast. Simon? Thanks, Tyler. Right now, we have a beautiful end to your ideal spring day with clear skies and a picturesque sunset. It is currently a warm 50 degrees, and don't worry, today won't be the only day with weather this amazing. Later tonight, I'll be bringing you weather you can plan on here on Newswatch. Back to you, Laura. Thanks, Simon. Coming up after the break, we'll have news on a reservoir holding toxic water on the verge of collapse and a train crash in Taiwan that killed over 50 people. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Newswatch. We shift now to developments in Florida, where a toxic wastewater pond is on the verge of collapsing. This past weekend, residents in Manatee County were told to evacuate their homes due to a significant leak in the reservoir. Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency in the area and said the main concern for the evacuation was due to flooding. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection is prepared to um, and dedicated to the full enforcement for any damages to our state's natural resources. So that is definitely happening. It's just right now our top priority is ensuring the ceasing of the breach. Officials say if the pond is to fully collapse, a 20-foot water wall could impact the surrounding homes. Crews are currently working to pump the water out of the pond and tests will be performed to determine if any materials from the reservoir made their way into the water supply. And U.S. Representative Matt Gates is now under hot water tonight as new information has surfaced, alleging the congressman of showing his colleagues photos and videos of nude women. Sources say the Florida Republican took out his phone and showed his fellow lawmakers images of the woman he slept with, calling it a source of pride for Gates. Gates is currently under investigation by the U.S. Justice Department for having a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old girl. Gates has denied the allegations and said he is the victim of an extortion plot. Providing for flights uh, and hotel rooms for people that you're dating who are of legal age is not a crime. U.S. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy has since come forward, saying he will remove Gates from the House Judiciary Committee if the findings of the investigation prove to be true. And now turning back to Florida, where Governor DeSantis has just banned the use of COVID-19 passports. DeSantis signed the executive order Friday restricting government sites from distributing the passports and blocking businesses from requiring them. The governor's order says a lot of people in the state have yet to get vaccinated and cited the passports as freedom and privacy concerns. DeSantis said the Florida legislature is working on making his order into law, and he looks forward to signing it soon. And family and friends gathered to demand justice for 13-year-old Adam Toledo for the second night in a row. Toledo was shot and killed by police last week in Chicago after officers responded to reports of multiple shots being fired. When they arrived on scene, that's when officials say Toledo fled and began a foot pursuit before being shot. He was so full of life. Mama! They just took it away from him. I just want justice. I just want, I just want answers. What happened? Toledo's grandfather says he wants to know what really happened and that he hopes the truth will come out soon. The Chicago Office of Police Accountability said they will review the body cam footage with Toledo's family sometime this week before releasing it to the general public. And country star Dolly Parton has received her second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine that she helped fund. The singer got the shot on Friday and thanked the doctors at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Parton had previously donated $1 million to the school's COVID-19 research team, which included the development of the Moderna vaccine. She received her first dose back in early March and posted a video encouraging viewers to get their own. Tennessee will start allowing residents 16 and older to get the vaccine starting tomorrow. And here with us now, we've got Dane Richardson for a quick look at sports. Dane, what's up? Tyler, it's rare to see an Ithaca sports team on a losing streak. Well, the Ithaca baseball team, they were on a losing streak, losing three in a row heading into the weekend. Could they bounce back against RIT? Stay tuned to find out. Thanks, Dane. Moving on to news across the world, Egyptian officials announced yesterday that the Suez Canal is now completely cleared. 
in what authorities say is the vital artery of the canal. Nearly 500 ships are now freed from waiting in line and, continue, and can continue their respective journeys. The initial cause for the blockage began on March 23rd as the Ever Given ship was grounded in the canal for more than a week. The backlog halted trade and cost upwards of $15 billion per day. An investigation is currently underway to determine what caused the Ever Given to get stuck in the first place. And at least 10 people were killed due to a suicide bombing yesterday in the Somali, Somali capital of Mogadishu. The bombing comes on the heels of two previous attacks on national army bases by the Al-Shabaab Islamic militants. Military officer Hussein Noor said the army lost several lives due to the recent explosions. The army has since regained control of both bases. The militant group has issued no comment on the deadly bombing, but officials worry that the attacks come amid growing concerns that al-Shabaab may be exploiting the country's political vulnerabilities. The fragility comes in part from parliamentary and presidential elections not being held last February. And the manager of a Taiwan construction site who authorities believe caused a train accident has been released on bond. More than 50 people have died in the accident, which took place near Hualin County in eastern Taiwan. Officials suspect that the site's manager failed to properly engage the truck's brake, causing the accident. The truck slid down from a construction site beside the tracks near Taroko Gorge and hit the train. The youngest person to have died was a six-year-old girl and the oldest, a 79-year-old man. Workers have been removing portions of the train. It is likely more bodies will be found. The former Crown Prince of Jordan, Prince Hamaza bin Hussein, has been accused of plotting with foreign entities to destabilize the kingdom. Reports say the prince allegedly paid a visit to tribal leaders and garnered some support from them to destabilize the country. Sixteen people, including one of his former advisors, have also been arrested for allegedly threatening security. Prince Hamaza has denied any misconduct and said he was not part of any conspiracies or coups. And more than 20 mummies of ancient Egyptian royalty passed through downtown Cairo in Egypt for the Pharaoh's Golden Parade. The mummies were being relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Tahrir Square to the National Egyptian Civilization about three miles away. Eighteen kings and four queens took part, including some of the most prominent Egyptian rulers of the past, such as King Ramses II. Officials are hoping the new museum will attract visitors as COVID-19 restrictions ease. Visitors will be welcomed beginning April 18th. And coming up after the break, Simon Neeland will be here in studio with the latest on this week's weather forecast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Newswatch. We're now joined by our weather person, Simon Neeland, who will give you an outlook on the seven-day forecast. Simon, are we going to be seeing better weather this week? Well, Laura, after a cold weather and snow last week, today is the beginning of a new wave of warmth. Throughout the day, we had sunny skies above us with an enjoyable high of 56 degrees. Tonight, we will see clear skies and bright stars, a perfect one for astronomers and those hoping to make a wish. We will reach a low of 34 degrees as the morning approaches, which is still better than freezing. Tomorrow will be an exact replica to today with a temperature around 50 degrees with sunny skies and a few clouds passing by throughout the Monday. Perfect sweater weather to start off your week. For our seven day, for our seven day forecast, we will be looking at a week of wonderful spring weather. We will start off with mostly sunny skies around 58 degrees on Monday and Tuesday. Clouds will then approach on Wednesday and Thursday, but they will certainly not stop the heat. We will see a 10 degree temperature increase with highs of 65 and 68 for the two days. April showers that bring May flowers will start this weekend with a Friday high of 58 and some rain throughout the day. It will remain cloudy around 60 degrees on Saturday with rain showers resuming on Sunday with a high of 57. Make sure to get outside this week and enjoy the sun before the rain comes bringing weekend indoor fun. This has been Simon Nealon bringing you weather you can plan on here on Newswatch. Back to you, Ty. Thanks, Simon. Looks like it might finally be some spring weather. Coming up after the break, Dane Richardson will join us for your sports update. And as usual, you won't want to miss it. We'll be back after this.
Welcome back to Newswatch. Our very own Dane Richardson is here with updates on sports. Dane, what do you have for us today? Well, Tyler Lara, first off, happy Easter to everyone celebrating this weekend. Now, if you've been following the Ithaca baseball team, you know they've lost three in a row heading into the weekend. So they weren't searching for eggs. They were searching for a win. The Bombers played RIT in a doubleheader on Saturday, and it turned out to be a split. Game one did not go the Bombers' way, losing 12 to 5. As for game two, it looked to be the same result until the bottom of the seventh inning when someone, maybe even the Easter Bunny, woke the Ithaca offense up. The Bombers tallied eight runs in the inning, collecting seven hits. Garrett Bell got his first win on the mound this season as the Bombers move back over the 500 mark on the year. They play next at St. Lawrence on this Wednesday. Before I move on, let me ask you a question. What do you think when you think of the Ithaca women's lacrosse team? Undefeated? Well, you'd be correct. The women were back in action for two games against ranked William Smith, and even though it's a holiday weekend, they did not let up. Check out this goal right outside the 8-meter. Megan Mikowski, the nasty fake, going ground for the goal, finding the back of the net. Ithaca would go on to win 13-7. to You see the celebration afterwards. The Herons, however, they look for revenge the very next day, and it came down to the final quarter. Ithaca led 8-7 to with under three minutes to play until Alexa Ritchie got the dagger. Bombers held on. An important stat in this one, senior goalie Mackenzie Shade had a season-high 11 saves in the win. The weather is getting warmer as the spring continues, but what if I told you we had some Ithaca basketball this week? No, this is not a late April Fool's joke. The Ithaca women's basketball team held a scrimmage against St. John Fisher on Friday night to honor their four seniors. It stayed close throughout the first three quarters, but anyone who's watched this program knows, come crunch time, they turn it on. A 17 to nothing run in the final stanza pushed the Bombers to the win, highlighted by this play. Right off the rebound in transition, it's sophomore Natalie Smith threading the needle to junior Lindsay Abertelli for the layup. Ithaca would go on to win it 64-50. to Something else to note, three of the four seniors for the Bombers will be returning to use their extra year of eligibility. As we head into my fourth story, usually I have to start talking pretty fast because we might be short on time. Well, this fits in perfectly. Ithaca women's track and field ranked number eight in the nation traveled for a meet at Rochester on Saturday. When it comes to Parley Hannon, it seems like there's a new record every week. Hannon posted a school record in the 1500 meter race with a time of four minutes and 28 seconds. Not only is that a school record, it's the fastest time in Division Three this year. The women won the event by 16 points. Don't blink if you watch the women's track team, but the same can be said if you watch Gonzaga and UCLA last night. Jalen Suggs' buzzer beater made everyone and their grandmother fall out of their seats, and now we can say the Leitner shot, the Jenkins shot, and even the Suggs shot. Let's take a look. They've been unbelievable, you know, to hold Michigan to 49. That's two teams we've held under 50 in this tournament. We held Alabama to 65 in regulation and BYU to 60. Just an awesome, awesome effort by our kids, and all credit goes to them. Clearly heartbreak for UCLA head coach Mick Cronin. Gonzaga advances to the title game to face the Baylor Bears in one of the most anticipated title games ever on Monday night. And the first time since the 2001 preseason, number one and number two are matching in the title game. I know I'll be watching. Tyler, Laura? Thanks, Dane. We end the night with a story on two seniors reuniting after a year apart. A couple married for 72 years has finally been reunited after the pandemic kept them apart. During their time away from one another, they actually both got the virus and beat it. The couple only had socially distant visits, but they weren't nearly enough as the long-awaited real in-person ones. They will celebrate their 73rd anniversary together in September. And that is all we have for you tonight. You can stay up to date with ICTV News on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we'll be back with you on Tuesday with Mark Scaglione and Emily Latimer. Have a great night, everybody, and happy Easter.